So this is it, the movie we've all been waiting to see. And it looks like after recent events, some people are going to be waiting for longer to see it. And I suppose I should talk about that recent tragedy, but I'm going to save that for later. And right now, tell you what I thought about The Dark Knight Rises. Probably, I don't want to say it was the most anticipated film of the summer. I think that would be The Avengers. Probably The Avengers was the most anticipated film of this year. But The Dark Knight is definitely its rival. So how do I talk about this movie without giving anything away? Um, we're judging this one as the final part of a trilogy. And does it do well to end the trilogy? Oh yes indeed. As a matter of fact, I could think of... Well, no, I, I can think of better ways to end the trilogy, but I think that this is probably the best we could have asked for in the final part of a three-act film. If you want to compare the other, if you want to put the other two movies in there and say that this is all one massive adventure. I guess that's where I should start, is this movie really does complement the other two extremely well. It ties up everything that was left open at the end of The Dark Knight. And it does well to really honor the tradition that began with the first movie. As an action movie, it's definitely up there with The Avengers as one of the best action movies of the year. The action sequences involving the new vehicle, which you've all heard about, and apparently it's just called the Bat in this. If you want to call it the Batwing, I guess you can do that. And all oh, this thing is awesome. Now, the Bat vehicles have never really been all that visually appealing to me. And by that, I mean, like, the original 1989 Batman. That Batmobile looked cool. So did the Batwing. They looked awesome. And I don't think that the Chris Nolan vehicles have ever been that great looking. That's just my opinion. But it's what they can do that makes them awesome and how Batman looks operating them. You know, these vehicles I never really thought were like eye candy, but I'm not saying that's a bad thing, because when you see these things in action, oh, oh, it's awesome. Now, what about the drama in the movie? Oh, I think it delivers in that department extremely well. There's an emotional scene between Bruce Wayne and Alfred. It could very well be the most emotional scene between the two of them in any film, and it really delivers and you really feel the punch of it. The very end of the movie, I won't say what happens, but it is truly an emotional experience, and one that you may not have expected to get from a Batman film. Now, the big question that I think anybody who wants to see a Batman movie and wants to see this movie, the big question on their minds, how are the villains in this movie? <laughs> That's what cracks me up with so many people that argue that Batman's the better hero than Superman, and yet all the attention always seems to go to the to the villains. It's one of the things I liked about the Chris Nolan movies is they really went into Batman and, and gave him a lot more development than he had in the previous movies. I love the previous Batman movies, the first two Tim Burton ones, but the Chris Nolan ones, I, I really feel that they're the, they're the movies that nailed it. But anyway, uh, the villains... Thomas Hardy as Bane, awesome. Unbelievable. Now, of course, he's got some big shoes to follow with the performance of Heath Ledger as the Joker from The Dark Knight. But man, does this guy make up for that stupid cartoon Bane in Batman and Robin. Oh my god. The way they do his voice... It really sounds threatening, and it also, it's not a dumb Bane. That's what some people think and mistakenly think about Bane, is that he's supposed to be like this all-muscle, no-thought. No, Bane's smart. He's a strategist. And in this film, that comes across perfectly. The only real issue I have with Bane is not how the actor plays him. It's the way that he's written, and I, I guess I'll get into that later on. But, also the big question, how is Anne Hathaway as Catwoman? If you remember my first review of Batman, I mentioned that Anne Hathaway was 
was rumored to play Catwoman, and I freaked out in the in the video. So I just thought it was like the worst idea. And honestly, when I did hear about it, I was really angry, and I thought, how the heck could they cast Anne Hathaway as Catwoman? And my first thought back then was, why do they even need Catwoman? And I kind of stand by that. I don't really think she was needed, but I have to admit she was done extremely well. Anne Hathaway played a very, very, very good Selena Kyle. Without really delving into her psyche too much, you understood where the character was coming from. Her deal was survival. She had the same skills as Bruce Wayne, and whereas Bruce Wayne used them to protect Gotham and to protect other people, Selena Kyle is just really looking out for number one. And you kind of understand where she's coming from. She's not privileged, and she's really had to struggle to survive, and so... She turns to crime because that's what she knows, and that's how she stays alive, and she, <laughs> she does it extremely well. It's really awesome in this movie to see just how well she outsmarts people. You know, Batman does it, the Joker did it in the last one. It's interesting to see how she outsmarts people, and I think that's really worth it for the, for the fans of her character. Uh, for those who want to see the feline attributes of the character not much to be found it's pretty much what you've heard the rumors that it, it's pretty much just somebody hears about a cat burglar and that's how she gets the name i don't think they even mentioned the name catwoman once in this film and that's probably a good thing now i've never really well okay i've been a, a fan of batman and catwoman's romance but i just got really tired of it as i said and i really wanted to see a romance between bruce wayne and talia al ghul Though I really think that they made some strong decisions regarding the romance between Bruce Wayne and Selena Kyle in this. It's not really... It, it's very subtle. Uh, they don't give you a whole lot, which you don't need a whole lot. That's the thing. A lot of times in comic book romances, they make the mistake of droning it out in, in these long speeches that are trying to be so romantic. And in the Batman movie... The romances have never been like Peter Parker and Mary Jane, or even Superman and Lois Lane. And I'm glad that in this one, it's probably the first Batman romance since, like, the second one, like, since Batman Returns. It's probably been the first time that I... Okay, yeah, the first one, uh, the first 1989 Batman movie did a good job with the romance, too. But this is the first Chris Nolan movie where I really liked the romance. I never really cared all that much for the uh, Rachel Dawes thing, but that's just me. I know some people really liked her. You know, whether you liked Katie Holmes or not. And they don't forget about that character, in case you were wondering. But I've been beating around the bush a little bit. Let me talk about something that I think really resonated with me as I watched this movie. You may be wondering how much they honored the comic book. And with Bane, they did it big time. And yet they didn't. Spoiler alert here. They really don't do anything with the Venom. There's basically no mention of it whatsoever. Uh, I guess it's safe to say that he's never used it. He has the mask and it's kind of more of a life support thing than, uh, than this Venom that gives him his strength. Which is kind of strange because Bane does kick the living crap out of Batman. Oh, and God, is it wrenching. Really, really strong scene. And parts of it are right out of the comic book. Including the damage to the Dark Knight's spine. What happens after that, though, is extremely original and extremely well done. You really feel the triumph when Batman returns. Let's just put it that way. But I was rather disappointed that they didn't do the whole thing with the Venom, partially because I wanted a good explanation for why Bane could do what he did to Batman. And other than the fact that he is, again, spoiler alert here, trained by the League of Shadows, but I think everybody heard that one, his training seems to be 
the very thing that destroys Batman. Not any kind of strength, which is interesting, but I really think that anybody who can beat up Batman has to be real impressive physically. And I really think that the Venom would have helped with that. Because he does prove to be extremely superior. And you do see how, like, the training of uh, the League of Shadows has played a real big role in this battle. You know, Batman will get rid of all the lights in the room and Bane will be like, Oh no, not the dark, I'm scared. You know, all the tricks that would normally work on any given criminal, they don't work on Bane at all. And let me just say that, like, Bane as a villain, you gotta wonder, because the Joker in the last movie proved to be such an effective and almost unstoppable villain that you ask yourself, who could top that? And, well, Bane does. <laughs> Bane definitely does. He leaves a path of destruction like you would not believe. But anyway, they did a really smart thing when Batman was trying to come back, when he was trying to get his back healed. It doesn't happen like it does in the comic book. He's down there in a prison, the very same prison that Bane was once in. Like, it's, it's a huge pit, and people can actually try to climb, but nobody can make the impossible climb or the impossible jump, so it's really just Bane's way of trying to give them false hope before crushing it. And they tell Bruce the story about how this little child was able to escape. And if you know anything about the comics, you immediately connect this with Bane. But what really stops you for a second, and really what makes you go, what? In fact, my girlfriend, who doesn't know anything really about comics, said, huh? When it was revealed that uh, Bane is connected to the League of Shadows, and in a dream, Ra's al Ghul visits Batman, and Batman realizes that Bane is Ra's al Ghul's son. And you're probably calling <coughs> on that one, if you know anything about the comics. But um, I would say reserve your judgments. And uh, hopefully, if you see, if you're listening to the review this far, you already have seen the movie and you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, they tell the story about this little this little child that had a protector. And the child actually made its way out. And Bruce decides that has to be Bane, and somehow he was able to survive. So eventually, he finds a way to, to get out of there. And of course, it's a psychological journey, similar to what he took in the first movie. And when he gets out of there, man, you really feel the triumph. But remember what I said before about reserving your judgments because the whole thing with Bane and connected to the League of Shadows it was genius because at the end of the movie when Batman finally wins which I, I kind of felt their final battle Batman and Bane like it was awesome for a while but then it was just over way too quick I really did not feel satisfied with with the way he was taken out not to say that Catwoman can't play a role, but I just expected a really big, huge brawl between the two of them like the last one. And it was like that for a while, but then it was over too quickly. And yet, one of the interferences was quite interesting. Where all of a sudden, Batman gets stabbed against all odds by the woman that he that he romances with during the film, but I always thought that was kind of like a business opportunity. I never really got the sense that he was, that he was really into her. He might've been attracted to her. Uh, and of course this woman turns out to be none other than Talia Al Ghul, which I almost suspected, but I had heard so many different rumors ever since I mentioned my, uh, my preference for Talia Al Ghul. You know, people had said to me, Talia is in the movie. Some people would say, Talia is not in the movie, and go back and forth. So I didn't feel like chasing dead shadows in this thing. And so I, I avoided labeling certain characters, even when it seemed like it. 
even when it seemed like a character was going to turn out to be another character from the Batman franchise, you probably know what I'm talking about if you've seen the movie. And what's funny is every little hint that I had that I pushed away ended up being true. But anyway, with Talia al Ghul suddenly showing up and that twist, wow, that was clever. It really took your knowledge of the comic book, if you knew the comic book, and used it against you. Because in the comic book, Bane is a prisoner. As a little child, his mom is locked in prison and he's born in prison. And he has a protector too. Or I don't know, I don't know if protector is the best term for it, but he definitely had someone who was kind of watching him. And so that's why you think the child is Bane, but it turns out the child is Talia al Ghul, which I thought was awesome. Now, Talia al Ghul isn't really given the chance to shine in this one, but the little that she is given is exactly what you'd want. Someone looking for revenge, looking to finish what her father started. And I thought that twist was awesome. It did take some of the thunder out of Bane. And like I said, I was disappointed in the way he was dispatched. But I thought it was a really cool story. You know, really just some nitpicky things that I have with this movie... But other than that, I think that this was everything that I hoped it would be. Right down to uh, kind of establishing that there might be Robin, which I think they were smart to kind of show that and just get out of the series right then because <laughs> they definitely did not want to do stuff with Robin. And I don't know, maybe somebody will pick it up now and somebody will do a story just about Robin, kind of a spinoff. But as much as I really think that the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, there could have been like 10 of them, and I don't think I would have gotten tired of it. There's so many stories they could have picked up. There's so many stories they could have done well. And yet I kind of think that it's this is the way to end, to leave the audience wanting more, as opposed to the last time that the Batman franchise stopped, that was because people were just sick and tired of it. <laughs> so sometimes the best way to end is when people are all wanting a sequel. And that ending, you know, I, I almost wondered when I... when I thought for a second that they might have killed Batman since it was the end of the franchise... I almost wondered if they they had the courage to do something like that because that would be a big deal, killing him off. Because it's a big part of the DC franchise and I don't know that it would be a good idea to do that. I know I talk a lot about people need to, people need to have a little courage and kill off some interesting characters, which they've done on several occasions in these movies. So I actually think keeping him alive and the way they showed that he was alive, perfect. Batman revealing his identity to Jim Gordon. I'm kind of turning that one around my head, like if that would be the thing for Batman to do. You know, he is about to die, so it does make sense, but from, you know, a, a fan of the character, I don't know if Batman would really do that, but I thought the way they did it, was awesome and the the speech that the not a big speech I'm kind of glad that they toned down a little bit on some of the speeches that, that were in the last movie but just a few words from Batman saying that anybody can be a hero even somebody that puts a coat on a on an orphan boy and tells him everything's going to be okay you know that message I think will hit home with a lot of people so flaws of this movie Really just a few nitpicky ones, like uh, I think that Bane did get kind of shortchanged by the end, though. I, can I really complain? Because I wanted Talia al Ghul in this. Uh, maybe if they made, uh, I don't know, maybe if they did something slightly different with Talia al Ghul and slightly different with Bane, like maybe if Batman actually took down Bane first and then realized there was another enemy, I think that would have been cool, but I don't know. Would have liked to see the Venom and would have definitely liked to see a bigger battle between Bane and Batman at the end of it. 
Uh, another one that's kind of nitpicky is uh, Bruce Wayne is walking with a cane throughout this movie, which is fine, like, that he finds something to heal it. But it kind of annoys me in superhero stories where someone is given a good excuse or a good way to hide their identity that they don't use. And I like that that he found a good cure, and I'm not wholly disappointed that they didn't re-injure the knee. But why isn't he pretending to still need the cane later on? Like, wouldn't that make perfect sense? If you got some kind of miraculous healing, it wasn't miraculous, of course, but, like, if you were able to heal some injury and allow yourself to fight crime, wouldn't you, as your alter ego, want to, like, pretend to still be hurt? Wouldn't that make it more unlikely that you're Batman? <laughs> I, I don't know. It just seemed like he should have done that. It's the same issue I have with Smallville Season 3. There's an episode where Clark Kent loses his sight for a little while and then starts to gain it back and then uh, not completely, so he needs the glasses. But at the end of the movie, he discards the glasses. It's like it, it would have made so much more sense for you to wear those things and and use that as a disguise and kind of lay any rumors to rest that you might be Superman. Or, well, of course, he wasn't Superman back then. Same problem with this one. I think that's a little nitpicky, but still, I was wondering about that one. Was it hard to believe that Blake, you know, Jim Gordon Levitt's character, figured out that Bruce Wayne was Batman. We've never met this character before. I thought he was, at first, when he was telling the story, I thought we were going to find out that it was that kid from the first one, the one that um, the Batman gives the, whatever he's using, the periscope or whatever. He gives uh, the periscope to him. I thought it was going to turn out to be that kid, because as soon as that, that kid showed up, everybody thought, oh, it's going to be Robin. A lot of times in this franchise, you see something and you think it's going to be like some popular Batman character. But like I said, that's why I kind of kept my expectations at bay during this movie, because so many of them are wrong. Like last year when I saw that thing with the, the name Ward, I <laughs> connected that to Robin for some reason. That was really stupid. But here we are, you know, we're at the end of an awesome franchise, and I'm sure that in the future there will be other Batman movies. They probably shouldn't pick up right from where this one left off. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a spin-off on Robin or, or something. But if there's a place for the franchise to end, I think it's good that they didn't like, continue to bank on this one and give us, you know, the Dark Knight or Rises Again or the the Dark Knight and the Boy Wonder or something stupid like that. Okay, so, I mean, that's the movie. Go see it. Definitely. But uh, a lot of people, as I said, are probably not going to see this one after the recent tragedy in Colorado. And my thoughts and prayers go out to all those involved. And I do feel that I have to say a few words about that because this is going to raise all kinds of issues of uh, violence in the media and the role of violence in the media. And, of course, a lot of people are probably going to point fingers at the Chris Nolan Batman movies for what happened. And there's a few things i got to say. First of all, a big problem, I think, is not these movies – I really don't think that, especially with this situation, I think that implying Batman is reaching. The guy dyed his hair red and then says, I am the Joker, and then all of a sudden people are pointing towards the Dark Knight, and I'm sure there's going to be some people that are going to think the Dark Knight movies are somehow responsible, and I, I'm sorry, I can't say I agree with that. But I do think that there's a big responsibility that people are missing. And that comes down to the parents. When my girlfriend and I saw The Dark Knight, there was 
some really, really little kid in there. There are a lot of little kids. And this is not a movie for little kids to see. So many little kids are exposed to things that they really shouldn't be exposed to, and that comes to the parents. You know, you got a five-year-old kid, that kid should not be playing Call of Duty. That kid should not be going to see The Dark Knight Rises. That kid should not be going to see The Bourne Ultimatum. Or what's, what's the new Bourne mo movie that's coming out? The Bourne Legacy? Kids should not be exposed to this kind of thing. The funny thing is, like, I was watching a media special last night, right before Jeopardy, and they were talking about how, like, it's not good to show the kids this stuff, uh, don't let them see too much of it on the news, and yet they're overexposing it on the news. The news is showing this stuff so much, and we're supposed to be keeping kids away from this? I'm not saying that I have the answer to the situation, but I definitely think that Staying away from the movie because you're afraid of a copycat is a little extreme, but if it makes you feel safe, you know, do what makes you feel safe. All I'm going to say is, if there's somebody to blame in this situation, it's not the movies. It's the fact that people are letting kids see these movies. You want the kids to see something Batman. There's plenty of kid-appropriate stuff for Batman. Keep kids away from stuff that's violent until they're of age to actually see it. You know, there's ratings for this stuff for a reason. You know, we all have a responsibility to children and to each other, and trying to put it on a movie, I think, is just plain ridiculous. But that's my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I'm sorry to get political in a, in a movie review, but I know a lot of people are talking about this. And, again, my heart, my thoughts, and my prayers go out to those who suffered in this incident, and... I hope that everybody will be safe and go and see this film and that it may inspire you to make this world a better place because it did inspire me.